This is a new thing. Um, so, whoo, little weird. I've been building to this for about probably about 16, 17 years. Hi, I'm Dr. Alex Lloyd and welcome to the new Jesus. Uh, before we go to the board today, I'm going to go to this board. Uh, I guess screen goes to the board would be a more accurate way to put it. But we are we're wrapping up a four-part series on love and then we're going to transition to, okay, this four-part series on love Let's apply this to the belief profiling that we've talked about earlier and see how practically we can use this information, uh, get rid of the negative stuff, increase the positive, and move on out for our best life possible. Okay? So there's a little bit of review in this and then a little bit of kind of transitioning to the next thing. All right? So... Here's the deal. There's some circumstance, okay? And here we're talking about negative circumstances because the positive ones we're not worried about. Bring them on. Let, let as many positive ones happen as we can and more and more, okay? So some negative circumstance happens that hurts, okay? Something happens that hurts, either physically or non-physically either hurting a whole lot or just a little bit, okay? You, you know boredom hurts, okay? I'm dyslexic and ADHD. Boredom is one of the most painful things in my life and always has been and where I got in mo the most trouble uh, growing up because I was bored. So it can be physical hurt, non-physical hurt, um, either one. But something happens that hurts or maybe... Maybe it's not the circumstance at all. We don't even know why we're hurting. It's just we're going through our day somehow, and somehow something hurts, either physically or non-physically, and we're not even sure what it is. Well, it's probably in the unconscious, subconscious, ancestral, if that's the case, okay? But maybe you can find sort of what it is or where it is or at least what will heal it without actually having to find that unconscious uh, memory and belief and event because you can't always find it. That's the definition of the unconscious. So something happens that's negative that hurts. Typically, as soon as that happens, okay, the first thing you experience is the emotion or feeling. Hurt or something positive or a million things in between. All right? Usually, the second thing that happens is a thought and or belief about this circumstance and the pain that just happened. And then typically the next thing, if you're living in the negative numbers on that minus 10 to plus 10 instead of the positive numbers, is anger. If you're living on the negative, usually the next thing you experience after the, um, the negative feeling or emotion of hurt And then the belief or words about hurt, okay? And, it, and, and even the physical manifestation, if there is some. Hope was depressed for 12 years, but she had physical pain from that. Most people don't realize. And extreme physical pain. And that's not unusual, okay? So whatever the hurt is, if you're living in negative numbers instead of positive, and remember our... Our, um, our minus 10 to plus 10 scale, okay? So if you're living over here, if you're living over here instead of over here, then nine times out of ten, when the negative thing happens, 
even if it's not really negative in the circumstance, but what you experience from it is a negative and it hurts in some way, you're going to tend to go to anger. Then you have a choice. After the circumstances and whatever happened from the circumstances, you have a choice, you have a belief, and you have a commitment. Okay? You may not know you have a commitment, but you either have a commitment to maintaining the status quo in your life, or improving something, or doing something that's pleasurable or painful, but maybe is also negative, but I want to do it because I, want, because I need that ple pleasure or pain relief. Okay? So a circumstance happens. Pain, if you're living on the negative. If you're living on the positive, you typically don't go to the negative. All right, so th this is the positive, but if you experience the negative and anger, you're going to tend to go to the negative, not the positive. The positive, it, and, and I probably just mixed you up there, sorry. Um, but if the circumstance happened and you, exp and you were living over here, at least as far as that issue, then you have a choice, a belief, a commitment. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm, my commitment is to the high road, and here, as best I can, God help me. All right? All right? And so then, choice. But the choice is based on the commitment. So I can have a get better commitment, uh, a whatever feels good commitment, basically, or status quo. Then, if I choose, if my commitment is to love, and, and being right with God in that four-step thing, number one, love. Number two is uh, only good no matter what, okay? No matter what my circumstances, my desire is only for the good. Number three, do the absolute best in everything I do, not 99%, 100. And number four, prioritize and invest in relationships daily. So if I'm doing that, that's my commitment. Okay? If I'm not committed to that, if I'm just committed to seek pleasure and avoid pain, then I'm living over here and I have and my choice is over there. So my choice is pleasurable for me or eliminating pain for me, getting out of work for me, making money for me, buying something for me, whatever. All right? But if but if I'm committed to love and and that's my belief, then my choice is empathy, the power, submission, the action, and then finally God's love, providence, and the outcome. God's will be done. Your will be done. What Jesus said the night before he died. I believe there's three components in that, and they're the same three components in all of nature. Frequency, amplitude, and wavelength. Frequency is the identity. Frequency is what it is. We talked about that last week. Uh, if you, it, and that's typically in hertz for frequency. Um, but a knowledgeable scientist or one that had the chart with them, if you gave them the frequency, they could say, ah, yes, that is uh, dirt or that is a shirt, or that is skin, or, or whatever, just from the frequency. It, that's the identity. And everything in nature has an identity, and it's its frequency. All right? Uh, Albert Einstein was right. E equals mc squared. What does that mean? Energy's on one side, everything else is on the other. That's what it means. Everything boils down to energy in a matter, so to speak way, even though some people would say energy is not matter. All right, so the frequency is what it is. That's the identity. The amplitude is how much power is there, and the wavelength is how fast it is. Okay, the amplitude, everything in nature can be demonstrated with that. Okay, so let's say that is the frequency of cancer. Okay? Well, in physics, if you want to change this, if you want to get rid of whatever the identity of this is, you hit it with a different identity, a different frequency, and that changes this one. So, 
let's hit it with a different a different energy. Kind of an equal opposite. And let's say this is the frequency of cancer healing or no cancer. All right? Now, how in the world would there be a frequency of no cancer? Well, you ever heard of an MRI? I bet you think an MRI takes internal pictures of your body because the doctor will typically bring out a, a sheet and, and say, um, and it'll be a picture. It'll say, hey, uh, Dr. Lloyd, you see that spot on your liver there? Uh, we need to check that out. Well, the MRI didn't take a picture of my liver. The MRI is programmed with hundreds of energy frequencies. The frequency of a healthy liver, healthy liver cell and the frequency of an unhealthy or cancerous liver cell. So what an MRI does is it shoots all those frequencies. It scans your body for frequencies. And if it picks up the cell of a healthy liver cell, it paints a picture of this on here. If it picks up this frequency, it paints a picture where the doctor says, you see that, that spot? We need to take a look at that. But it did not take a picture. It scanned for frequencies. So if you hit this, the cell that has this frequency with this frequency, what happens? Well, glad you asked. Boy, is that the worst eraser in the world or what? Well, I'm not going to take the time to redraw it, but you end up with a new frequency that hopefully is now no longer cancer. Okay? And how do you do that? Do you do that with, you know, I showed you a frequency counter the other day. Um, you use it with some gadget that's... <laughs> no, 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 no. You use the intervention tools that we're teaching you. You turn it into a prayer. You do the belief profiling. You ask God to heal it. You go to Revelation 1 to the throne room and kneel before the Father and your will be done. If you want to do something to me, tell me something, give me instructions, reprimand, whatever you want. I'm here on my knees confessing, repenting in humility. Please help me, okay? That's how you heal these things and the interventions we've been showing you, in my opinion, okay? And my first choice is always for God to just do it, okay? So, the three things about nature, frequency, amplitude, wavelength, what it is, it's identity, power, and speed. An example, let's say you score a minus six on anger. Okay, minus six, and man, you have got a great, big, huge anger thing right there in your spiritual heart. Okay? Well, what, what information does that give me that I can work on? Well, I can work directly on the anger with the same interventions, and I can pray to God to please heal this anger, whether I know where it comes from or not. But I think there's another way that can be at least a little, give you a little more information to be helpful. We talked last week about when the negative does happen, if we're in the negative numbers, this was the positive numbers, but if we're in the negative numbers, it virtually 100% of the time activates anger or something in the anger family. Anger, irritation, frustration, resentment, bitterness, overwhelmed, on and on and on. All right? So let's say that anger was a minus six. Well, that's the frequency right? That's, that's its identity. So minus six is the identity of your anger. 
at least about that issue, which is what you've decided to work on because maybe it's more negative than anything else. It's bothering you more than anything else. All right, so minus six is the identity. But there's two other components, right? The power and the speed. Uh, the amplitude or power is determined by how high these peaks are. That's the power. The, uh, so, so the frequency is the identity. The height of the wave is the power. And then we have a third one, which is uh, wavelength. And the wavelength is the speed. So the, the wavelength is however far, let, let's say it's this, uh, um, this red one. The wavelength is taking a spot on one wave and measuring how long it takes to get from here to the same spot on the next wave. So the wavelength is the speed. The amplitude is the power, and both are critical as far as these internal issues and living your life in love, okay? So minus six in the example was your anger, all right? But let's break that out more to give us more information into speed and, into amp speed and wavelength and amplitude or power. So let's say the speed is minus two. Okay? But the power is minus eight. Averaging a minus six. But this tells you a lot. All right, what does it tell you? It tells you that your big deal with anger is not how often you get angry. Speed is how often it occurs. So the biggest issue with anger is not how often you get angry, it's that when you do get angry, which is not real infrequent, but maybe not like every day or even every week, but when you do get angry, man, you blow. People are like, clear out, or somebody's gonna get hurt, all right? So when you work on that anger, either through prayer or with our tools or, or belief profiling or whatever, Man, that's where I would focus. I would focus way more on the power than the speed, okay? Uh, way more on how big you blow up than how often you blow up, okay? The other thing I would do is say, okay, is there anyone else in my family? Does my mom or dad have like anger at a minus six? And if they do, is it possible their power, the intensity when they do blow, is somewhere close to minus eight. They don't blow that often, but, so in other words, mom's paradigm is very similar to mine. Or maybe granddad's paradigm is very similar to mine. Or great-granddad, or a cousin, or a brother, or it could be anybody, a friend you had when you were little, uh, whatever, all right? Well, that tells me, though, that I need to work on that person, okay? If, if this is similar to mom or dad or granddad or whoever, I need to not only work on the anger, I need to not only work on what I'm committed to and if I'm in the negative, I'm probably committed to the wrong thing. I'm probably committed to seek pleasure and avoid pain. And you can also track that, okay? Where's the seek pleasure? Maybe the seek pleasure for me is 
plus three, okay? So I'm not that huge on, you know, drugs or alcohol or food or, you know, stuff that's just pleasure, pornography or whatever. Um, but pain for me is maybe minus nine. Well, I've got a seek pleasure, avoid pain problem, but it's not really with the pleasure. It's with the pain. So I'm going to focus on the pain. And, and is there someone in my genealogy, again, who struggled with pleasure and pain, but the pain part was way worse for them than the pleasure? Well, I probably inherited stuff from them, or absorbed it, or learned it, or whatever. So I need to work on the anger. I need to work on the person, okay? I need to work on the belief. which leads me to the commitment, either for love or seek pleasure, avoid pain. I need to work on the image. There is always an image. For every belief, every person, there's an image. Pierce Howard, PhD, in his wonderful book, The Owner's Manual for the Brain, all data is recorded and recalled in the form of images. Doesn't matter if it's a smell, uh, audible, Seeing, tasting, touching, doesn't matter. It's encoded and recalled in the form of an image. So even if it's not an image, your unconscious mind makes an image and stores it. And when something happens that's similar to that, it recalls that image. Even before the event itself or the feeling or the thought about it, it recalls the image first. Why? Because it's the fastest. Okay? Uh, it happens in a microsecond. Thinking about it in words or beliefs or whatever, that takes time. And in time, that can mess you up. Okay, so I need to work on the person, the belief, the image. I need to work on uh, the identity, the thing it is, which is anger. And lastly, I need to work on any extenuating, doubt I spelled that right, circumstance. Meaning, did your house burn down? When I was about five years old, our house burned down. Everybody in town was standing out on the sidewalk watching it burn down. Me too, in my footy pajamas, okay? Was that a trauma in my life? <laughs> yeah. Uh, my dad, when I was 10, 11, 12, started hitting me after he found out he had heart disease and was saying, Alex, you'll never mount anything. Did that affect me? Yes, that, that was a trauma, okay? And I've had a, a, a number of others. I've had some popsicle memories where I was a little kid throwing a temper tantrum, etc. But, 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 I need to identify these things, okay? The person if I can, and work on them. If not, just who, when I pray, whoever's involved in this that I'm not remembering or connecting, please heal that too. The belief. Um, I believe when uh, anger hits, I have to seek pleasure and avoid pain. I have to go protective. I have to get angry. I have to fight, freeze or flee. I have, you know, whatever. That's your programming. Uh, what's the image it brings up? Okay, you can tell that by your feelings and thoughts. Okay, and then just sort of let one float up. Okay, the thought is anger. Um, the person, I don't know. The belief is that um, I'm not going to be okay if this happens. Um, I don't know what uh, the extenuating circumstance is that the IRS sent me this letter and they're threatening all kinds of stuff, okay? The image, I don't have it yet. Ah, now I've got it. It's me in jail because of the IRS. And then I open the IRS letter and it's a refund for $5,000. <laughs> that was wasted time, huh? But I need to identify all the, the circum any extenuating circumstances, a trauma, a popsicle memory, uh, even an extreme positive could qualify. Uh, that's, the, that's the deal where 
the rest of your life you're trying to get it again, but it's elusive. You can't get it. It's not something you really should be going after. So the person, the belief, the image, the identity, the identity is the person. No, the identity is the anger in this case. Let me write that in. Identity, anger, and then the extenuating circumstance. And then work on all of that together to change and create a new paradigm that's no longer cancer, that's no longer anger, that's no longer seek pleasure and avoid pain, that's love, joy, peace, identity, worth, etc. Okay, let me see if that's all from the other side. Um, yeah, so when something's bugging you, you, you experience hurt. Okay? That's the first thing. The circumstance and then the hurt. Then the feeling or emotion about the hurt and the circumstance. Okay? Um, then the image for the circumstance. The person, the belief, image, ID, extenuation. Find all of that. Work on them, all of it together. All right? Okay. Now, let's take a look at the screen today. Our postulate. You have a secret number that can show you... Well, I, and, and I should change this. You have a secret number that can help you determine meaning and purpose that almost no one knows. A secret number that cannot show you all the time, maybe, sometimes show you, but all the time give you more information and, and give you a better idea of your meaning and purpose than you had before. All right, so this is back to last week. Anatomy of love. Commitment to an intention for good for all concerned and the accompanying action for their best interest regardless of positive or negative for me. Number two, the secret to love that 9 out of 10 people aren't doing, the key is submission. How do you do love? To the submission, you have to add empathy. Empathy is the power. Okay? No, I'm sorry. Empathy, yeah, empathy is the power. Submission is the frequency. I'm going to get in there and do it. How often am I going to do it? I don't know. How often do they need it? How often am I going to help in a situation where I feel like people need help? Okay? So, the thing itself is love, to get it, I have to do, I have to empathize, we talked about that last week, submit, and this is, so I can, I can track every relationship, I was going to go to my minus 10 to plus 10 thing, but I think you can remember it, I'm going to go to every single relationship, all right, and rate it for empathy, rate it for submission, okay, how much do I empathize with this person? which is a measure of how much I love them, okay? And how much am I submitting to them in our relationship, or how much am I willing to submit to them, okay? In, in a win, 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 love, 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 love way, all right? Um, you don't always... Submission to another person... For instance, let's say that other person is a mean person. Well, submitting to them when I am 99% sure they're going to hurt me may not be the best thing to do because it may hurt them. Putting, my, putting myself in a situation where I believe they probably will hurt, hurt me, and they can, either physically or non-physically, well, hurting me is not good for them. That's not the loving thing for them to do. So the loving thing in this situation, might, in that situation, might be to submit to a degree, but not to the degree that they hurt me and hurt themselves because of hurting me and hurt me because of hurting me. That's lose-lose, not win-win. Okay? So, I apply empathy and submission under the parameters 
of love. Which means it might be a negative thing. Disciplining, in my opinion, disciplining a child is a very positive thing. Now, spanking a child, no. I believe that's a negative thing. Okay? But disciplining in love is one of the best things you can ever do with a child. Well, most people wouldn't consider disciplining submitting, but it is. It's submitting to love toward that child who just did something that they need to learn from it. It's not punishment. It's to help them learn, right? Okay, so submitting to love in regard to that this person in this situation means disciplining them in love. Oh, I'm so sorry, son, but uh, because you ate that whole bag of candy when I told you not to, um, you're going to need to clean up your room. I'm so sorry. Okay? And, and, and love-based discipline is always done in love, kindness, compassion, even hugs. You know, I, I'm disciplining you, but I'm so sorry. I, ha I feel like I have to. I don't want to do this. I love you so much. So go clean your room and let's try to not have this happen again for both our good, okay? Um, how do you do love? Empathy, submission to love, love feelings, love thoughts, love beliefs, love energy, love action, okay? Plus, love is the 300, really 600% solution. The research says if you are living um, in selfishness versus love, you're 300% more likely to get a disease and die in middle age. If you're living real love, you're 300% more likely to live to old age happy and healthy. So it's really 600 so if you do all of these, the result is typically happiness, success, great relationships, health, etc. Does that mean no pain? No, there is no path with no pain. It means pain with happiness, success, great relationships, health, love, joy, peace, etc. That's what it means. The circumstantial cascade. Okay, we talked about that over on the board. The circumstance happens. It hurts, physically or non-physically. That hurt creates a reactivation of a belief, thought, feeling, whatever, uh, uh, which makes us mad, sad, afraid, bad, unsafe, failure, identity, and habits and addictions, which I also call love substitutes. Okay? So, in this example, you're in the neg you're you're probably living in the negative numbers, or you're at least very negative about two or three areas, or you wouldn't be in the negative areas overall. Okay? So when this is the way the cascade works, it tends to go to love substitutes and then an unhealthy feedback loop over and over and over and over. The definition of insanity, repeating the same thing, expecting different results. Unforgiveness in danger. Why danger? Because Scripture says I'll be forgiven as I forgive and I'll be judged as I judge. So if I am if I am practicing unforgiveness, Scripture says God may not forgive me, which puts me in the biggest kind of danger we can experience, in my opinion. On the other hand, let's say you're living in the positive numbers, circumstantial cascade two, circumstance hurt, ah, but not sad, mad, all that stuff, disappointed. Why? Because I wouldn't count on that end result anyway. That's seek pleasure, avoid pain. That's expectation. I've given that up as best I can. I'm living in the present in love. Your will be done on that end result stuff. Okay, so I'm not really expecting anything. So when the negative happens, yeah, I would have rather have had the positive. Anybody would, but I'm okay. And I still choose, even though I'm disappointed, the love and truth path. That takes me out of danger. Now I'm moving on to the next higher place, better place in my life. 
Two of my favorite quotes, Gandhi, when I despair, I remember all through history the way of truth and love is always one. There have been tyrants and murderers, and for a time they seem invincible, but then they always fall. I love this. Think of it always. And then the Apostle Paul, yeah, there's one law, that one rule that everything else is summed up in. In other words, if you do this one thing, you don't have to worry about the 10,000 things. They'll take care of themselves. The one thing is love. All the law and the prophets hang on love. Conclusion, love wins. Anything and everything else, you lose. So, how'd you get here? Okay, if you're in those negative numbers instead of the positive, how'd you get here? Take the true you test. I think it'll give you a lot of uh, information about that. I would also take the X factor, okay? Uh, the X factor is going to show you your four primary pillar issues in life. Which one is your strength? Which one is holding you back? And then fix the one holding you back. Get on that strength and ride it as long and hard as you can, okay? Your secret number can deter can help. Okay, let's not, let's get rid of the definitive words. I shouldn't have put determine. Your secret number can help you determine, or or at least get a feeling for your meaning and purpose in life. If it does, you will not reach your full potential until you fix that number. Well, what number are we talking about? Well, we knew you had a minus six in anger. Remember, let me get that set up. The example was you had a minus six in anger, but that's made up of two things, okay? The minus six is your identity or, you know, the three things in nature. Everything has a frequency, a color, a wavelength. It has uh, a power and it has a speed. Amplitude, wavelength, frequency. And in the spiritual realm, or in the mental realm, or in the health realm, we, we say the same thing. So, the anger is your identity at minus six. But it's made up of two things. There's a power, and there's a speed. Now, they could both be six, and then everything is six, but that rarely happens. Typically, either the speed or occurrence is a whole lot... Uh, is more than the power or less than the power, and the power is more or less than the speed. In this case, our example was your anger was at a minus six. The speed or, or how often you get angry was minus two. How big you get angry when you do was minus eight. So you work on both of them, but this is the priority. And you're looking also for someone in your genealogy or that you've been close to that you would say might have a minus eight power on their anger, okay? And, it, and if you find that, you need to work on that person and maybe that person and you too, okay? So that's what we're talking about. That's the secret number, is the minus eight and the minus two, because that gives you more information, more specificity, and also can lead you to people and an image and a belief and you know that stuff we talk about for all for every one of those negative things there's you need to look and see is there an extenuating circumstance an image a person a belief okay now there may not be an extenuating circumstance there will always be an image a belief in a person you may not know what they are, but there will always be one. And if you meditate on it enough, the image will almost always float up. The belief you can usually figure out as far as, okay, what kind of situations do I get angry in? And, and is it way more at this person than that person? Is it more for me at one time of the year than another? Is it more for me in the morning than at night? I mean, anything's possible, okay? So, but because remember, this goes back into your ancestry. 
hundreds of years. Well, they could have been doing anything, all those, an all those hundreds or thousands of ancestors during those years, okay? So you need to look at all of these, all right? Okay. So that's how it can help you with that. So what's the science? All of nature, humans, animals, plants, everything. Uh, amplitude plus frequency equals outcome. Specificity plus power. But one factor is missing, and that is speed. So once we add that, now we should have a complete picture. What's the science? Everything. Amplitude, power, frequency, identity, what it is. Wavelength, how often it occurs, equals outcome. Okay, so this is another diagnostic you can use. What's my issue? We've been talking about anger, but it could have been acid reflux in my 20s. It could have been Hope's depression in her 20s. It could have been Dr. Ben's ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. It could be a work issue. It could be a relationship issue. It could be anything, animal, vegetable, mineral. But everything, no matter what it is, is going to have all three of these. It's going to have a power. It's going to have an identity. And it's going to happen either frequently, infrequently, or in the middle. Okay? And that determines your outcome. Okay? So you have to see, you got to do some soul searching and say, all right, have I committed to seek pleasure, avoid pain, and end results? Or have I committed to love, joy, and peace? And it's science. Depending on which I've committed to, and I may have committed to it unconsciously, but whichever one I'm committed to, this is what's going to happen. Whatever the amplitude, frequency, and wavelength is, it's going to produce the outcome. So if it's a negative amplitude, negative identity, negative wavelength, it's going to be a negative outcome. And it can even possibly be that it has a negative identity, but a very low occurrence and power. Okay. Well, that's not as big a deal. Maybe that's a minus one, all right? So that's not going to take as much work. It could also be that the identity is negative and the occurrence is negative, but maybe just barely, and the power is huge. Or it could be the identity is something good, but the, wave, but the frequency it hardly ever happens, okay? Maybe this is uh, helping other people, but I hardly ever do it, all right? And when I do it, my heart's not really in it, okay? So you can really look at any issue from these, um, from these three areas that are true of how God made all of nature, but we're looking at it as your issues, your internal state, your love versus fear, your health versus illness, all of the above. There is an algorithm inside of you. God may be the only one that knows exactly what it is, but you can guess at it pretty good and still work on it with our tools and it will heal. Or, again, my favorite way always to go to Revelation 1 to that throne room, get on my knees, repent, confess, Father, may your will be done, and for God to do it directly. Okay? Now, if he doesn't do that, is it okay for me to take these? Well, God made everything, made it good, and made it for us to use. And Scripture says when we use it for a good reason, a good purpose, and healing is a good purpose in Scripture, give God the credit and thankfulness, we sanctify it, which means clean it, make it right and good. Okay? So this is a little algorithm you can do yourself along with the belief profiling on virtually any issue and every issue you could have. All right. So amplitude, power, frequency, what it is, wavelength, speed, it's your choice. Find out your minus 10 to plus 10 from the true you or X factor and discover your purpose and, and, and 
meaning. Now, now, how could that mean that? Your purpose and meaning. It's simple. Remember, about every one of these, there are these factors. A person, a belief, an image, uh, the identity itself, and is there or is there not an extenuating circumstance? There's not always one of these. There's always one of these, even if we may not know what it is, but we might be able to sort of figure out what it is. All right? So, how do you do it? Well, it is right here. What's your commitment to? Doesn't matter how you got the commitment, even if it was unconscious, even if it happened when you were two and you've never even thought about it since then, you can tell by your com what you're committed to by what you keep doing and the results you keep having. If you keep having anger, if you keep having uh, low self-worth and stuff, it it's virtually guaranteed you're committed to seek pleasure and avoid pain. You're committed to self-interest. You're committed to what I want, when I want. All right? Well, that is going to cause you to end up in the negative cascade that we talk about and over here. All right? If, on the other hand, your commitment is to um, love, joy, peace, being right with God, etc., then you exercise empathy, the power, you submit the action and speed, and the outcome is, is determined by God's love and His promise. Okay? And whatever that is, I win. As long as God's will be, is being done, I win. See, we tend to evaluate most of us winning and losing by whether it turns out pleasurable or painful. Problem with that is very often the painful thing is the better thing and the pleasurable thing is the worst, especially as an adult. All right? We shouldn't be evaluating by that. We should be evaluating by is God's will being done, is love, is it, is God's will being done and is it love based? And if it's God's will being done and it's love based, that's the right thing in this situation. Period. So make that your commitment instead of seek pleasure and avoid pain. Is this God's will being done, which will always be love, God is love, and love-based? If so, then I can have empathy, I can submit and live over here. And eventually get to plus seven and above, which is sort of that magical best life or really, really close to it. Okay? All right. Next week, I plan to transition and get even more practical about how you can actually take these things you feel and are finding out about yourself and are concerned about and work on them so practically that they will heal virtually every single time. Okay? So that's where I'm planning to head next week. Let us know if you have any questions, comments, and um, really try to marinate and absorb this because this is, this, is, this is crucial stuff. Okay? God made us to work in a similar way that He made the world besides us to work, okay? Identity, power, and speed, okay? So start looking at those issues and, say, and seeing what you're committed to versus maybe what you need to be committed to to have the life you want and to live over here and to help the people you love and care about live over here. So, how in the world would this show meaning and purpose? Well, it's really pretty simple. 
if my commitment is to seek pleasure, avoid pain, then my meaning and purpose is what I want when I want and self-interest for me. Okay? If my commitment is to God and love, then my commitment is to what is right, what is the will of God, what is win-win-win for everyone concerned, and what is love in the present moment regardless of the end results. Okay? So, if I'm committed to God and love, my meaning and purpose is um, I'm a child of God and my purpose to be pleasing to God, to live in love, to help others, to, you know, give others a hand, to prioritize relationships, all that. If I'm committed to myself, pleasure, pain, you can be committed to a thing like anger, too. Uh, just, that's the way you are all the time. You're full of anger, and you act out anger, and you think anger, and you hormone anger, and you brain state anger, and, you know, um, that's a terrible identity, but it can be one. Now, it's not your real identity. Your real identity is a child of God, uh, made perfect, that, and God wants to be in loving relationship with you. So it's not your true identity, but it's the one you're living, okay? All right, so um, see where you are, and let's... Start looking at the factors, what we're committed to, shift that commitment, and start living over here. Power, frequency, speed. Those three components in everything. Identity, power, and speed. Your biggest issues, where are those? And what are you committed to? And does that need to change? And if so, what needs to change? And what steps do you need to start taking? That's where we're going next. Have a great day.